Welcome to LeagueNet.com. Join me today is former Assistant Secretary of State for Arms Control and Nonproliferation Stephen Rademacher. Stephen had a long and distinguished career in the United States government, including Assistant Secretary for Arms Control and Nonproliferation in the Bush Administration, Chief Counsel with the House International Relations Committee, Senior Aide to Senate Majority Leader Bill Frist, and he currently is an international consultant here in Washington. Stephen, welcome. Good morning, Fred. It's a pleasure to be here. Stephen, I wanted to talk to you today about an important report that is coming out today by the Bipartisan Policy Center's Iran Task Force on the threat from Iran. First, could you tell us what the Bipartisan Policy Center is and then tell us about this report? The Bipartisan Policy Center is a think tank here in Washington. Um, it was co-founded by uh, four former uh, majority leaders of the U.S. Senate. Uh, and it, uh, um, seeks to forge bipartisan uh, solutions to some of the most pressing problems facing our nation. Uh, it, it has had a task force on Iran for about uh, almost five years now, and, I, and I've been a member of it since the beginning. We have issued a series of reports about U.S. policy toward Iran. Uh, the one that is issuing today will be our fourth report. Uh, the the co-chairmen of the, the task force today are uh, former Senator Chuck Robb, a Democrat of Virginia, and uh, former Air Force General Chuck Wald, uh, former uh, uh, NATO Air Commander. What are the major conclusions of the report? Uh, our, our basic recommend, well, the point of departure of the report is that the uh, Iran nuclear problem is not going away. To the contrary, it's becoming uh, more acute. Um, you know, there, there's been this, this hope, this belief that um, actions have been taken that have disrupted and slowed down the Iranian nuclear program. There was the Stuxnet computer virus, which uh, many people ascribe to the Israelis or, or some, some other intelligence service. Uh, there have been uh, mysterious uh, killings of, of nuclear scientists in Iran. Uh, there have been continued efforts to enforce export controls and uh, apply more vigorous sanctions against Iran. And so the hope has been that the combination of these things would somehow slow down the, the rate of progress of the Iranian nuclear program. But uh, all evidence is to the contrary. The, the International Atomic Energy Agency, which tracks these matters, reports that uh, in their most recent report, Last November, uh, they demonstrated that the, the rate of enriched uranium production uh, in, in Iran is, has been continuing, continuing to grow. It's almost twice as, as they're producing uh, enriched uranium at almost twice the rate today that they were producing it before the Stuxnet virus. So maybe the Stuxnet virus slowed it down, but it, it certainly didn't change the, uh, the, the overall progress that they're making. And so we, we believe the, the problem remains critical. And um, it, it is therefore essential that um, the United States and, and other concerned countries take action to uh, persuade Iran to change course. Um, our, our basic recommendation is that uh, we vigorously pursue a policy uh, with, with uh, three, three elements to it. Um, the, the first is um, uh, continued uh, application of sanctions and, and hopefully uh, enhanced application of sanctions against Iran. Uh, Obviously, sanctions have been in place against Iran for a long time, but they have not succeeded in persuading Iran to abandon their nuclear weapons ambitions. So uh, obviously, more needs to be done for, for this to succeed. Um, we also um, recognize that there, there needs to be a diplomatic option. Now, uh, none of us are very optimistic that Iran uh, is going to seize the diplomatic option that, that's available to it. Uh, you know, I think one of President Obama's great disappointments was he extended the hand of diplomacy to Iran. and, and uh, Iran spurned it, and uh, they have continued to spurn it. Uh, the last uh, a year ago, the last time that the two sides met, um, the Iranians basically said, "Drop all your sanctions, and then maybe we'll talk to you. But if you don't do that, we're not even going to talk to you." I mean, th that was the level of commitment on their side to, to having a, a diplomatic resolution to, to this problem. Uh, the third element that we talk about is the need that for the there, for there to be a credible threat that, if all else fails, military force may be used to prevent them from acquiring a nuclear weapon. And um, of those three elements, uh, we, we believe the, the most underdeveloped today is the third, that um, there are sanctions in place and there, there are efforts underway, many of them driven by the US Congress, to strengthen uh, the application of sanctions to Iran. The, the diplomatic option is out there for Iran. Um, again, you know, it's, it's not at all uh, evident that Iran is interested in it, but it, it, it's out there for them. What is uh, not out there is a credible threat that, that force may be used. There, there are occasional threats you know, vocalized uh, about uh, force might be used. But in terms of demonstrated 
military capabilities, there, there's not much out there. And in fact, um, what is out there is often contradicted or, or undermined by statements by senior officials implying that uh, under no cir cir circumstances would we be prepared to use mil military force. So we recommend that steps be taken to enhance the, the credibility of that threat. And um, we have recommendations about uh, um, deployments of, of uh, U.S. naval uh, capabilities, uh, military exercises uh, by the United States and its allies in the region. Um, and then we, we also talk about enhancing the, the credibility of the military threat from Israel, which um, is, is the other potential military threat that, that Iran faces. Stephen, there's been a there still is a debate in this town concerning the 2007 National Intelligence Estimate that Iran has not made the strategic decision to actually produce weapons, that they're engaged in weapons-related research, but they have not actually decided to make weapons. And there actually has been recent reports by Washington-based think tanks that maybe the threat from Iran is overblown. Where do you come down on this debate on whether we should be looking at Iran through the lens that maybe it hasn't decided to pursue nuclear weapons with its nuclear research? Well, in my opinion, the, the 2007 uh, National Intelligence Estimate on Iran is, a, is an embarrassment. Uh, and uh, I don't know many people who, who continue to, to take it seriously. Um, I think um, the, w whether they made the decision to actually manufacture a nuclear weapon or not, I don't think any of us know. We, we, we can speculate about that. But what is crystal clear is they have made the decision to be able to do that uh, at a moment's notice. Uh, they, they want to have all the pieces in place in order to have a nuclear weapon should they wish to have one. And wh whether they've actually, actually taken that final step and decided that on a particular target date they intend to bolt all the pieces together and actually have a nuclear weapon, um, we don't know. And, and frankly, it's not that important. I, I think what's critical is that they intend to be as close as possible to having a nuclear weapon so that they get the treatment that, that what they think will be the, the enhanced uh, prestige in the world and the enhanced influence, the enhanced ability to uh, intimidate their neighbors um, that would come from, from uh, being a, a nuclear armed state. The, the, the center's report comes out at a crucial time in light of statements by Director of National Intelligence Clapper yesterday that Iran is stepping up its acts of terrorism and does not seem uh, susceptible to the substantial uh, sanctions that would be placed upon it. Do you think the sanctions against Iran are going to work, or have they had any effect? I, I think they've had some effect. Uh, my frustration is um, we are in the process of stepping up sanctions right now. And finally, as a result of action by the US Congress, uh, an amendment offered by Senators Menendez and, and, and Kirk uh, at the end of the last session of Congress, uh, steps are now being taken to uh, attempt to cut off the Central Bank of Iran from the rest of the international financial community, which would have the effect of making it very hard for any country to pay for to pay the Iranians for Iranian oil, which in turn would make it hard for Iran to export oil. Uh, this is a long overdue step. Uh, why why it is that we're now in 2012, uh, just beginning to to implement that kind of measure when it was obvious for years that that sort of thing was where where Iran was most vulnerable, um, is to me very frustrating. Um, so I'm glad that these kinds of steps are underway. I hope um, additional steps will be taken. But I worry that we've waited too long. Um, I, in fact, there, there is, there's a debate, uh, as I understand it, within the US intelligence community right now about how the Iranians will likely respond in the event that sanctions become substantially more biting. Uh, what we want is for Iran to respond by changing its mind about its nuclear weapons pursuit. But they have made so much progress. They are so close at this point that there is a, a dissenting view that uh, if, if sanctions become truly painful for the Iranians, they may decide, uh, instead of uh, backing away th at this point, to make a mad dash to complete their program and then assume that, uh, you know, as was the case, say, with Pakistan, that um, once they, they demonstrate a nuclear weapon, uh, weapons capability, that at some point thereafter, maybe not immediately, maybe not a month later, maybe not even a year later, but not too long thereafter the world would reconcile itself to what Iran has done and, and um, essentially rehabilitate Iran. I don't think that's what, what Iran would do, but I, I think the fact that we have to wonder about that uh, to me is proof that we've waited too long to take the kinds of measures that we're taking right now. Stephen, in your career you've had a lot of experience drafting sanctions legislation and you've drafted some of the most important sanctions laws uh, punishing rogue states, 
But these laws are not always carried out by presidential administrations. Could you talk about that? Yes, uh, I, I witnessed that firsthand, uh, both as, as a congressional staff member doing oversight of, of the implementation of those laws, and then as an official of, of the Bush administration, uh, which, and I, you know, I was in a position to, to um, uh, oversee at least part of the, the implementation of, of some of those laws. And there is a natural resistance um, within the executive branch of the United States government, uh, and I think this is true under, under any U.S. administration, to, um, to hesitate to fully ap apply these laws for fear of uh, diplomatic fallout, um, uh, because some of these laws are intended to sanction or, or punish uh, companies from friendly countries that unfortunately are, are um, assisting Iran um, economically or, or in some cases even more Is directly. this resistance mostly at the State Department or, or do you see it elsewhere? Um, I, I think there are other parts of the U.S. government that, that, that share that concern and, and I don't mean to say these are evil people. These are people who, who you know, just have a higher priorities than containing the Iranian nuclear program. To my mind, um, the Iranian nuclear program is uh, probably the largest single threat that our, our nation faces today and so uh, it's hard for me to identify any priority that's higher than stopping Iran from having a nuclear weapon. Uh, and so uh, I've always been frustrated at, at the, um, the um, delays uh, and, and the resistance that's encountered in implementing these laws. An issue concerning sanctions against Iran has come up recently with India. India is, is making it clear that it does not intend to abide by the recent EU oil embargo against Iran. And to get around U.S. and European sanctions, it appears that they are going to start engaging in oil trade using yen because the Iranians don't want Indian rupees. What can we do to convince our, our, our friends, the Indians, to cooperate with these sanctions uh, against Iran? Well, I think it was this, this sort of problem that, um, that not all countries um, share our, our uh, recognition of, the, of the, the severity of the threat and, and the need to act that um, led Congress to pass the, the Kirk-Menendez amendment uh, last year to the Defense Authorization Bill. Uh, that, that, that amendment um, uh, seeks to work indirectly. It, it doesn't work against governments, uh, but what it does do is um, it, it penalizes foreign financial institutions that do business with the Central Bank of Iran. And essentially any, any, um, any uh, country that's trying to make payment to Iran for, for oil purchases um, has to do that, or almost all of them do it by, by means of uh, payment to the uh, Central Bank of Iran. So Congress uh, is trying to address this problem through legislation, and now it's a question of how the, uh, the Obama administration will implement that legislation. Well, thanks for setting that straight. Thank you for coming today and for your analysis. Uh, thank you for watching a copy of the Bipartisan Policy Center report. A link to this, to this report will be on our website. Thanks again.